Good evening and welcome you all on the third virtual meeting of our Young Gynecologist Academic Group. We had two meetings in recent times, one on IPC protocols on IPDs, uh, OPDs, and another on IPC protocols on Caesar OTs. So we had plans that we will be resuming another uh, meeting on IPC protocols and resuming laparoscopies. But as the COVID is continuing, we decided we may switch on to some other subjects with meanwhile. So our, we are going to discuss on a very new subject today. It is on HIFU, that is high intensity focused ultrasound, which is an ablative procedure on malmas and adenomalmas. We have a very distinguished person uh, today for the, as our invited speaker, and he is Dr. Selva. Our chairperson on this evening is Professor Ifatara, Madam. We have two special guests, Professor Farana Dewan and Professor Salma Rao. We have uh, a distinguished set of panelists, Professor Nora, Madam, who is also our advisor, Dr. Nusrat Jaman from United Hospital, Professor Begum Nasrin for BMSMU, and Professor Muna Salima Jahan from uh, Sar Solimullah. We also have an invited panelist in our meeting, and who is Professor Malia Roshid, who is the Joint Secretary of OGSP. So uh, I would like to request our chairperson of this evening, Professor Ifatara, who is also our advisor, to have her introductory remarks. Professor Ifatara. Shunajache, can you hear me? Madam Shunajache, please. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this group for selecting me as the chairperson. Personally, I don't think I'm fit for being a chairperson. Anyway, thanks for giving me the honor and the opportunity. I want to share some few words. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yesterday, we used to do laptotomies for all the myomas and for all the adenomyosis. Today, we are doing the same. Some are struggling, struggling. Some are struggling with the laparoscopies, but laparoscopy problem is that the myoma bed cannot be so meticulously sutured like that in open laparotomies. Now, tomorrow or today, we are, we are getting these services of high intense frequency ultrasound, which is an ability process. And this process is also used for adenomyoma, for myoma, and even which I saw in the, in the uh, uh, internet, over the internet, it can be used for facial lift, for removal of the wrinkles. So it has also got a very aesthetic value also, but we are not going in detail of that value. We will remain to our medical terminology, that is, that is the removal of the adenomyoma and the removal of the myoma, because this, if it can be done by this high intense frequency ultrasound, this is a very less traumatic process, very less invasive and very little pain with very little discomfort and pain, the patient can be just taken home, just like the cryosurgery or the cryotherapy in case of CS cervix, CIN1 or two or three, we can do these things. So again, I want to thank you and over to the moderators and the speakers. I want to learn because this is a new subject. This is the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. So let's get on straight into the lectures. Farjana, uh, to me to Dr. Silver's lecture, Deepa. I would like to introduce our invited speaker, Dr. Selva. Dr. Sibila Raja Supermaniam, who is more commonly known as Dr. Selva. He is now working as a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist and an IVF specialist and laparoscopic surgeon, head of OBGYN and IVF unit in Mekota Medical Center, Malacca, Malaysia. Next slide. He was the president of two, two, during 2015 of APAGE, that's the Asia Pacific Association of Gynecological Endoscopy. He is the past president of Obstetrical and Gynecological Society of Malaysia Endoscopic Surgery Subcommittee, the chairman of Obstetrical and Gynecological Society of Malaysia. He is a past board member of the International Society of Gynecological Endoscopy, and he's one of the reputed members of the editorial boards of the reputed journal Gynecology and Minimally Invasive Surgery. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Selva. 
Dr. Selva, you can begin. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Selva, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Thank you. Can you see the screen? We can see the screen, obviously. Okay. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Maru for inviting me to speak on this topic of uh, high intensity focus ultrasound, a new modality in treating fibroids and adenomyosis. Um, my first slide is uh, acknowledgements. Uh, I have, I am not an expert in HIFU yet. I'm hope, hope, hopefully in the next one or two years I will be. Uh, all uh, my slides and uh, my advice and are from my teachers. This is Professor Lian Zhang. He is uh, of the professor of uh, for HIFU from Chongqing University, from whom I have learned this technology. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Lee Kin Wai, who is the uh, doctor doing. Haifu in Singapore. Singapore started uh, Haifu in uh, June 2018, and Dr. Lee Kinwai is the one that uh, runs the uh, Haifu Center in Singapore. And these slides that I'm going to show are from these two people. As I've said earlier, I have a disclosure. I will be starting my ultrasound Haifu Center uh, in uh, my hospital, in Makuta Medical Center. And this Haifu, Haifu machine is made by this company called Haifu, which I will, I'll be telling you all in a little while in China. And I couldn't start it. It should have started by June, but because of this uh, coronavirus and the lockdown, I have it has been delayed. The, my delay is now that uh, the machine is already here in Malaysia, but uh, the engineers from China couldn't come into Malaysia because Malaysia have closed the borders. So I'm hoping that by next month, uh, the engineers can come and install this machine and we can start the uh, treatment soon. Now, this is my outline of my lecture today. I'm going to talk a little bit on the history of HIFU. I'll talk on what is HIFU, the types of HIFU available, what diseases can be treated with HIFU, hi how is HIFU performed, how well is HIFU accepted around the world, is HIFU effective for fibroids? Is HIFU effective for adenomyosis? What is the complication rates of HIFU? Does HIFU affect fertility? What is the fertility outcome after HIFU? Which patients should be excluded from HIFU treatment? And at the end, the future of HIFU for fibroids and adenomyosis. So let me first start with the question of what the history of HIFU. Now, HIFU is not uh, new. It was first proposed, the concept of HIFU was first proposed in the 1940s by Lin. And in 1950s, the Fry brothers actually developed this technique uh, in an experimental system in Illinois in 1950s. However, the technique was not developed because they didn't have inadequate targeting methods. And it was not until uh, in about 1988 when the study of the biological effect of ultrasound was uh, uh, brought forward. Now, basically, a transducer concentrates the beam of ultrasound into a focal point. This is called the acoustic focal point. And this acoustic focal point uh, is, is where the, the energy is, is, uh, is given to. Now, it was first proposed that the hypothesis of a biological focal region in Haifu was, uh, was presented in 1996. And in 1997, this person called Professor Wang Zerbia, who is actually the uh, founder of the Haifu company in uh, China and, and uh, the, the, the professor, the brain behind this technology, uh, discussed on targeted effect of high intensity focus ultrasound on liver tissues and published in Ultrasonics Chemistry in 1997. So basically what happened is this focus will then destroy uh, a lesion and then this lesion can then be enlarged as more and more energy is, is, is uh, given to this area. So that's basically the, the whole process of Haifu. Uh, this is Professor Wang Zerbiao, whom I met a few times last year. Um, Haifu was first used to treat malignant bone tumors. Now, in, in, uh, in the, at that time, an 18-year-old patient who had underwent a Haifu treatment on osteosarcoma with, of the left tibia, the patient first had two cycles of chemotherapy with good response before HIFU treatment was given. She is in complete remission after 36 uh, months after HIFU. So this shows pre-HIFU treatment. Chemotherapy was given, but the disease was still there. And post-HIFU, the disease is completely gone. This is, this is how uh, uh, HIFU started, uh, ultrasound-based HIFU started uh, being used in China. 
Now, you all know there is something called an MRI-based HIFU. This MRI-based HIFU was uh, first FDA has given approval in, the, in 1988, and it, the machine is called X-Blade 2000, made by uh, GE. And in 2004, FDA approved this X-Blade for the use of fibroids. Um, uh, in the European countries, uh, Philips has come up with something called Sonoville, which is also a MRI uh, uh, design HIFU. Now, the ultrasound-based HIFU is uh, pioneered by this company called HIFU, which is a company from Chongqing. And these are the machines that they make. This is called the JC. This is called the JC200, and this is called the JC200D. And all these machines are, are used to treat uh, uh, different types of diseases. So, uh, so next question is, what exactly is HIFU? Now, HIFU, as I told you all earlier, it means high-intensity ultrasound waves are focused into a focal spot by a HIFU transducer. So there's a transducer that focuses the ultrasound beam to a, to a point. And at this point, which is called the biological focal region, the focal spot is heated and destroyed. So there is cavitation heating and coagulation necrosis of the tissue at that spot. So this focal spot is guided either by ultrasound imaging or by MRI HIFU. So there is a difference between the two. When we use MRI to guide us, guide the, the beam, then it is called the MRI HIFU. If you use ultrasound, then it's called ultrasound-based HIFU. And you can see that the, when, when the beam is, uh, beam is uh, uh, targeted, then you can get grayscale necrosis changes in the tissue. So what are the types of HIFU? I've already told you that there are two different types of HIFU, so you must not confuse. Many of you all must have heard about HIFU before, and I, and I think you would have thought that I'm, uh, HIFU is not very effective. That is the MRI-based HIFU. Ultrasound-based HIFU, although it's been there, has never been uh, widely publicized until recently. Now, the difference between these two is shown in this diagram. The first is that anatomical resolution. You know that MR, MR will give you a good anatomical resolutions. So um, that, is a, that is a strength of MR-based HIFU. So what happens is that you do an MRI, and then you shoot the beam into the, the tissue, and then you do another MRI. So uh, that is a problem with MRI HIFU. So first of all, it's, it, is, uh, uh, it is a retrospective kind of uh, diagnosis. That means you, it is not real time as opposed to ultrasound. Ultrasound, you're doing the ultrasound while the beam is being shot. Whereas MRI, the MRI is done after the beam is shot into, but the anatomical resolution is strong in MRI. In MRI-based HIFU, there's also temperature monitoring. You can, you, can, uh, you can monitor what is the temperature of the tissue being destroyed. This is not done in ultrasound-based HIFU. However, the advantages of ultrasound-based HIFU is that the transducer movement is, is tremendous. As you can see, this uh, transducer is in this hollow area. It cannot move very much uh, in the MR-based HIFU, as opposed to an open method here. Your transducer can move very much in this, in this uh, uh, ultrasound-based HIFU. Patient positioning is also very good for ultrasound-based HIFU here. You, the patient cannot move very much, whereas in an open basis here, the patient can move a lot and the patient is very comfortable in an ultrasound-based HIFU. The MR chamber is also very noisy. As you know, the MR moves round and round and the patient have all these noises. There's no noise at all in, in, in an ultrasound-based HIFU. The treatment time is also shorter with the ultrasound-based HIFU. As I told you earlier, ultrasound is real-time. You can see what you're doing, whereas MR is not real-time. It is done uh, after the, the shooting. So the time taken is much longer than uh, the time taken when performing uh, ultrasound-based HIFU. Now, as, as, uh, as you can see here, the treatment efficacy is also far higher in ultrasound-based HIFU as opposed to uh, uh, MR-based HIFU. The reason being, being it is being real-time you can actually ablate much more and, to, and, and get a greater efficacy with ultrasound-based HIFU compared to MR-based HIFU. And lastly comes the treatment cost. As you know, MR is a very expensive machine. This is, machine is also expensive, but because it can be done faster, you can do more cases here as opposed to uh, the MR-based HIFU. So the cost per treatment for MR is much higher than that ultrasound-based HIFU. I think the biggest advantage is that MR-based HIFU is always done by interventional radiologists who are very busy people. 
Whereas an ultrasound based HIFU can be done by anybody who is trained to do ultrasound. And there's a big advantage for gynecologists because at least gynecologists in most part of the world, or at least in my part of the world, we do our own ultrasound. So we are very comfortable doing ultrasounds. So we can do the treatment by ourselves and, don't, and do not depend on interventional radiology. So these are the differences between MR based HIFU and ultrasound based HIFU. I hope you can understand the difference. So my next topic is what disease can be treated with HIFU? Now, HIFU can treat solid tumors. Now, uterus is a very good uh, uh, organ to treat and uterus, the, 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 I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more on uterus in a little while. You can also treat breast tumors, liver tumors, pancreatic lesions, especially for pain control, kidney tumors, bone tumors, especially limb sparing and pain control, soft tissues and others. So, so it has got a lot of indications and we are now looking at even treating uh, uh, different types of cancers, May, different types of cancers can be treated using HIFU. But today we are going to talk about uh, gynecological use of uh, ultrasound based HIFU. We know that we can be used by fibroids and by adenomyosis, which I'll be discussing extensively, but you can also use for things like placenta accreta, caesarean scar pregnancies, and even abdominal wall endometriosis. These are other uses that people have used to uh, ultrasound-based HIFU to treat uh, gynecological diseases. So now, how is HIFU performed? Now, uh, I will show this video, uh, which uh, gives an idea, uh, uh, this video. And this, in this video, you can see how HIFU works. This is the bowl. And the bowl actually releases the, high, the, 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 the beam. And you can see that the beam is being, uh, there's burns on this plastic but the hands of the, the, the people here is not affected. So it is, it's, it's a very safe technique. It, it only burns the area where it's targeted and nothing in between. And this can be shown on this video. You can see this is an ox lever. And what is done is uh, this word is uh, written on the computer. It actually means China, it's Chongguo. And uh, they are using the, the haifu to draw on this, on inside the lever, uh, ox lever, these uh, words. And you can see that it is very precise. The, the, the burning can be done very precisely. And after this burning, this ox liver is cut. You can see there's nothing outside, but you can see that there is exactly in the middle, this word has been uh, drawn or coagulated into the ox liver. This is how precise uh, this uh, ultrasound based HIFU is. And you can see the principles is this. Now there is a lesion in the liver and, and it, is, it is a three-dimensional lesion, but we start off burning, coagulating one spot, and then we make it, we make the one spot into a line. And as, as, and then as, as, the, as we move the slices, one slice to another, then you can get the whole volume of the disease coagulated. As you can see, these are the volumes of that is being coagulated. So what we usually do is we start right in the middle and then coagulate that slice and then move on to the next slice and next slice until we reach the edge and then go back and then do the other slices. So in that way, by using just dots, these dots can be continued to become lines and then the lines can become a volume and the whole disease can be treated. This is a principle of HIFU. Now here you can see how this is done again. Uh, this high view transducer is the focal beam is brought into this area and we can see a gray scale uh, on the ultrasound and this gray scale then increases as we go along, the, the transducer is then moved and another gray scale and then we can move on to another area and another gray scale. So with this gray scale, we can slowly ablate the whole lesion. So now I'll show you a video that will explain the whole technique of how HIFU is performed. Can you, did you get, are you listening to the music? An ultrasound beam can be brought to a tight focus at a distance from its source. With sufficient energy concentrated within the focus, the cells lying within will be killed without damaging the surrounding tissues. High intensity focus ultrasound by Fu is Therefore, a non-invasive method of producing selective and trackless destruction of deeply seated tissue targets within the body. The 
without causing any damage to the overlying surrounding tissues. Ultrasound guided high food involves high food ablation under the guidance of real-time ultrasound imaging, which can achieve an uninterrupted visualization of tissue coagulative necrosis during the treatment via grayscale changes in real time. The ablated lesions demonstrate an echogenicity or grayscale changes in the ultrasound images after the sonication, which enables immediate assessment of patient's response to ablation, ensuring a safer and more controllable therapy. Imaging fusion and three-dimension digital reconstruction function provide doctors with a much clearer vision during the whole procedure. Thus, doctors can finish the treatment with an ease. Ultrasound guided high food, a new option for the gynecologist to manage uterine fibroids and other gynecological benign tumors, can maximally preserving the integrity of the uterus. No surgery, no bleeding, and no anesthesia. Patients can even chat with doctors during treatment to ease their tension. Patients can go home in nearly two hours after the treatment and resume normal life the second day after treatment. Post-operative MRI may still detect the presence of ablated lesions. However, vascularity is now absent in the ablated region, as the ablated lesion will gradually shrink or even disappear over time. The symptoms will also be gradually alleviated or eliminated. Ultrasound guided high food for gynecologists. Okay, as you can, I, I hope that gives you an idea of how um, HIFU works, ultrasound-based HIFU works. Now, there are many advantages of this HIFU therapy. The advantage is that it's non-invasive to preserve organs and structures with no blood transfusion and no radiation. Uh, it is a day surgery. It's done under sedation. It's quick resumption to work and availability of beds. Uh, it, is, it is very precise in its ablation. Uh, it does not require general anesthesia, only sedation. We call it conscious sedation. That means the patient is actually talking to us while we perform the procedure so that we can understand the patient's pain and then adjust the dosage accordingly. And also it's comfortable and relaxed and also very few complications, which I will discuss in a little while. So these are the biggest advantages of HIFU. So the next question is how well accepted is HIFU around the world? Now this is a machine that is made in China. And uh, so, as you as you know, many people are skeptical of, from, of of machines that are that are coming out from the from the east as compo composed as compared to from the west. I, I had the same worry, and I visited the place and uh, to see what how the machines are made and how this treatment is being being done. And you can see that uh, over the last almost twenty years, almost twenty six countries have got this machine with over two hundred centers in Asia and about ten plus centers in Europe. This is an old slide. I think there are more now, and more than one hundred twenty thousand patients have been treated using HIFU. Now uh, there's a very strong academic relationships with Oxford University, Frankfurt. Born Queen Mary's uh, Hospital, uh, Hong Kong, and also Taiwan Chang'an Memorial Hospital, and these are some of the centers in the in in the West. This is uh, the center in Oxford. This is in Bonn, Germany. This is in Frankfurt, and this is in Spain, and this is uh, in uh, in Hong Kong University of uh, Queen Mary's Hospital, Hong Kong. And there's a new center that is opened by my good friend uh, Dr. Felix Wong in Hong Kong. And also there are centers in Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and also in Egypt, South Africa, and also in Bulgaria. And uh, the, it, I think its biggest advantage is in Korea. Actually, I, I had a chance to visit the centers in Korea. I visited four centers. There are almost 25 centers in Korea now. And these are very small uh, centers in uh, shopping malls and they do very good high food treatment. And, and it's well accepted by the women in uh, Korea for uh, uterine fibroids and adenomyosis. So next is how effective is high food for fibroids? 
Now, um, there are numerous publications of, uh, of usage of uh, HIFU for fibroids. It is called FUS, means uh, fo uh, focal ultrasound surgery, focused ultrasound surgery. And uh, as you know, there are MR-based MR HIFU as well as uh, uh, ultrasound-based HIFU. And the HIFU company from Chongqing contributes to almost 52% of all publications in gynecology for uh, fibroids and adenomyosis. And these are numerous publications, and I will I will not I will, don't have the time to go through all of them. I will just pick one uh, of the uh, studies that was done in Chongqing Medical University in China between 2006 and 2009. They looked at uh, 757 patients with 1,114 uterine fibroids, and uh, out of these 757 patients. Uh, uh, majority are intramural fibroid, but some are submucous and some are some serous fibroid. And after the treatment, the non-perfused volume ratio, that means the, the amount that they, get, uh, they destroy inside is up to 85%. And this is important. We the higher the non-perfused uh, perfused, uh, volume of the fibroids, the more the chances that we have killed off that fibroid. And symptom relief is tremendous. There's 92.5% symptom reliefs in patients with fibroid. And also shrinkage of fibroids is seen to be 31.2% uh, at three months, 58% at six months, 70% at 12 months, 82% at 20, 24 months, and 89% at 36 months. So it's, it's a very effective treatment for fibroids. Now, what about adenomyosis? Adenomyosis, as you know, is a big problem for all of us, all of us uh, working especially in an infertility field, uh, we don't know what to do with them. We cannot get, we, they, we may be able to get good eggs from them, but the implantation is very poor because of all these uh, uh, nodules in the uterus. The first patient treated with adenomyosis was in 2007. She was a 37 year old lady presented with severe dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia. She had an adenomyoma of five by six by eight centimeters. You can see it's a diffuse anterior wall adenomyosis. And HIFU was performed in October, 2007. Uh, room time was one hour, five minutes, uh, specification time, nine minutes, every hour was 199 watts. And after the treatment, the patient's symptom was gone. It was, it, it shrunk and the patient was well. And this is a, a study done uh, in, uh, in this center called Sweeney Central Hospital where I underwent training, a very busy hospital where they do 100, 1,000 cycles of high food per year. And this, this is from January 2010 and December 2011. They did 350 cases of which uh, 244 patients completed a two-year follow-up. And this is what they found. The inclusion criteria was diagnosis of adenomyosis must be confirmed by MRI. The wall of the uterus must be thicker than three centimeters and the patient is unwilling to have a hysterectomy. And they underwent treatment. And the results, um, the characteristic of the patients are all here. I will not go through it in detail. And the results is that uh, the non-perfusion ratio is 72%, uh, 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 a percentage of non perfuse ratio. And also the success rate, the, 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 the patient with clinical effective rate after two years was 82.3%. Uh, it was complete relief in 21%, obvious relief in 44%. And partial relief in 15.3%. As you know, adenomyosis is a difficult disease. It's impossible to ablate everything unlike fibroids. So some patients will have some symptoms. But the important thing is, as long as the dysmenorrhea is reduced to a certain um, amount that they can continue their life without having a hysterectomy, that is very good. And also, as far as menorrhagia is, confirmed, uh, is concerned, 79% has reduction in menorrhagia, which, which, which they are very happy about. So what about complication rates of HIFU? Now, this is a study that was published in this uh, ultrasonic sonochemistry, a review of 9,988 cases who have undergone ultrasound ablation for uterine fibroids and, uh, and uh, adenomyosis, a review of the uh, complication rates. The complication rates were written as 10%, or 1,062 patients have some form of complication. But as you can see, most of the complications are here. They are very minor complications, such as vaginal secretion, slight lower abdominal pain, leg or buttock pain, oliguria, hematuria, and uterine bleeding, which have all resolved. If you look at serious complication, the most serious complication, the, the most, the, the most uh, worrying complication is skin burns. Uh, 22 patients have skin burns. Which, which are more severe, two, two of them are more severe. 
But the one that we are most worried about is intestinal perforation, which is two patients. Two patients out of almost 10,000 pa patients had uterine perforations. You can't get this kind of figure from laparoscopic surgery or even laparotomy. Uh, three patients had acute renal failure and one patient had hernia. So the, the, the number of cases with severe complications is only 0.6%. So the complication rates in HIFU is very low if we select the patients properly for, the, for this treatment. Now, this is patients, uh, patients with whom I've got a higher incidence of developing uh, skin burns are those with uh, surgical scars. When they have surgical scars, the scars absorb the ultrasound uh, waves and causes all this reddishness and skin burn. So we must be very careful when we are doing uh, HIFU for patients with surgical scars. The patient actually lay in a bowl of cold water to reduce the temperature of the skin. And this has to be done slowly if you are, if you are dealing with patients with uh, surgical scars. So next question is, does HIFU affect fertility? Now, one of the worries is that whether HIFU will affect the ovaries while it's being done. As we know, this, uh, this treatment is highly focused. The, the beam is affecting only the area that we are going to ablate. And this particular paper that was uh, published in the British Journal of ONG, changes in anti-mullerian hormone levels as a biomarker of ovarian rivers reserve after ultrasound-guided high-intensity focus ultrasound treatment for adenomyosis and fibroid. And they found that the AMH level before and six months after high full ablation were 2.11 and 1.84. And, and this was not found to be statistically significant. So one did not worry whether high full will reduce the fertility potential for a patient. The next is what is the fertility outcome after HIFU? And this is my area of interest because I'm a fertility specialist. I deal with a lot of patients with fibroids and I want to know whether I can use this modality to help patients to conceive without surgery. So this paper also published in the British Journal of ONG, pregnancy outcome in patients with uterine fibroids treated with ultrasound guided high intensity focus ultrasound. 78 patients were conceived after HIFU, 71 delivered live birth rate. And uh, it, it could significantly reduce the preparation period for pregnancy after operation. It can also improve fertility of patients with history of infertility and abnormal pregnancy of childbearing with no additional obstetric risk. So the biggest uh, worry is that if you do surgery, we know that if you do myomectomy, we're worried about uterine rupture, although the risk of uterine rupture is very low, but it's still a genuine risk. But this risk is not seen in HIFU. And also patients with HIFU, once it's done, as the fibroid shrinks within two, three months, the patient can start uh, uh, trying to get pregnant. Now, what about adenomyosis? And this is actually another area of my interest. Many of my patients have adenomyosis. And can I use HIFU to help them to conceive? In 2006, uh, uh, this uh, author uh, reported a 36-year-old lady with an 84 centimeter cube focal adenomyotic lesion who had difficulty in conceiving. After one session of uh, this, this is MR HIFU, the non-perfuse volume reduced to 33 centimeter cube. And the patient reported a significant reduction in menorrhagia and a remarkable decrease in size of the lesion after six weeks. The patient conceived spontaneously and delivered a healthy uh, term infant vaginally. In another study by Joe in 2006, he completed uh, 68 patients who were treated with adenomyosis patients who wished to conceive, out of which 68 patients, 58 conceived with a median time of 10 months, ranging from 1 to 31 months post HIFU, and of these 21 delivered healthy babies. No uterine rupture occurred during the gestation or delivery. And from April 2011 to February 2016, in Chongqing, China, where this uh, HIFU is developed, 52 adenomyosis patients who want to conceive after high food treatment were followed up. 20 conceived with a median age of 5.75 months after high food. 11 delivered healthy babies at term. There was no uterine rupture. So this is, looks very promising. Although high food as... Um, uh, when they started using HIFU, both MR HIFU and ultrasound-based HIFU, the idea was to help patients' symptoms only, not for fertility. But now we are looking more and more to use it for fertility outcome. And that's one of my area of, uh, going to be my area of research and um, uh, for this condition. 
Now, this is a case, um, uh, a 26 year old lady who presented with dysmenorrhea for 10 years with, uh, uh, and she had dysmenorrhea starting from day one to day two before the period until one to seven days after the period, most severe lasting one to two days. She was unable to get out of bed to work. She, she was married for three years without pregnancy. So the HIFU was performed. This is an, this is an anterior wall fundal uh, adenomyosis. And after, uh, after HIFU in two months, the patient conceived but unfortunately, she had underwent an induced abortion. She conceived again four months later and a full-term pregnancy. And so this is, this is, a, this is a successful case uh, of pregnancy after uh, adenomyosis treatment. This is another patient, 33-year-old patient who complained of dysmenorrhea for more than 10 years. Sometimes the pain couldn't be stopped, even, be, even with painkillers. She underwent HIFU. As you can see, this is a posterior wall adenomyosis, a diffuse adenomyosis. And this area was ablated. And this manual significantly relieved in two months after HIFU. She conceived six months later with full-term pregnancy. So this is all very nice uh, uh, cases. And we hope that uh, we can use this. And I hope, I hope that I can use this to help some of my patients with adenomyosis to conceive. So uh, the next issue is which patients should we exclude from HIFU treatment? Now, HIFU cannot be given to everybody. We have to select the patients. Uh, cervical tumor, there's a risk of contraction of the cervix due to HIFU treatment. Although now I think Professor Lian Zhang is even uh, treating cervical fibroids with HIFU. Uh, this is very important. If you see a, a bowel that is along the path of the HIFU beam, then you cannot perform HIFU treatment. This is probably one of the most important uh, uh, contraindications for performing HIFU. Extensive cutaneous scar, as I told you, the absorption of heat causes burns in the scars of, the, of these patients, and that is a, a contraindication. History of lower abdominal surgeries, which can, which in many cases, difficulties in exposing the lesion. Patient who have gone, undergone surgery in the last three months, acute and chronic infection, uncontrollable comorbidities such as hypertension, stroke, connective tissue disease, and radiotherapy. This is a, a contraindication. And now, leomyosarcoma is a contraindication. And this is an interesting topic, which I, I, I always debate with uh, Professor Lian Zhang. Um, we know that leomyosarcoma cannot be absolutely diagnosed even by MRI. We can suspect. If you suspect leomyosarcoma, then we shouldn't do HIFU. However, I'm sure there are many uh, fibroids out of the 100 or 1,000 patients that have been treated with HIFU. There are some who would have had my leomyosarcoma and HIFU has been done. But because this treatment is in, in the intracapsule, it, it doesn't release the sarcoma. And, 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 and so I think it is uh, not detrimental if you do uh, ablative therapy for an unsuspected leomyosarcoma, as opposed to if you do a laparotomy or a laparoscopy, you open up the capsule, then the uh, sarcoma will spread. So I think this is another advantage of HIFU for uh, uterine fibroids. Another contraindication is a patient who cannot stay still for more than one hour. They must be able to lie down uh, uh, when the treatment is being done. So uh, lastly is what is the future of HIFU for adenomyosis and fibroid? Now, this is my area of interest. Uh, this is a paper that I published recently in the, gynecol in, in, uh, in the gynecological uh, and pelvic surgery uh, medicine in 2019. It's entitled intramural fibroid and fertility to operate or not. Now, I, we all know that if a patient has got sub-serous sub fib sub mucous fibroid, that has to go. And if there's a sub-serous uh, fibroid, patients can conceive with it. But what about intramural fibroids? Now, uh, usually when the intramural fibroids are small, we leave them alone. But there are studies that show that even a two centimeter intramural fibroid pregnancy rates are lower compared to patients without fibroids. Uh, this is especially so if the fibroid is touching the junctional zone. Uh, so FIGO classification classifies this kind of intramural fibroid as stage four. I personally divide them to stage 4A and stage 4B. Stage 4A touches the junctional zone and stage 4B does not. But even small fibroids, we, we usually leave them alone. Uh, will affect fertility outcome. So I looked at all the options that are available to try and shrink this fibroid. This include ulipristal, 
um, uh, ablative therapies, uh, uh, ablative therapies, and also HIFU. And I think this is where HIFU will play a big role. If you have an intramural fibroid that's not cavity distorting, but still you're uncomfortable to do, say, IVF for these patients, you can use HIFU to ablate and kill off that fibroid, make it shrink it, and then do uh, HIFU. This will be an area of research that I'm interested in. Another area that is uh, uh, that I'm, that will be interesting is HIFU for adenomyosis. Now, this particular paper has shown that gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists combined with high-intensity focal ultrasound for adenomyosis, and they found that if you use GnRH analog for three to six months and then do HIFU, the patients do much better than the patients who did not receive high, uh, um, GnRH analog. Uh, another uh, area that will be interesting to look at is, can we combine HIFU with uterine artery embolization? Now, prof this Dr. Kim from Korea, what he does is that we know that uh, HIFU doesn't work well with very vascular tumor. If a uh, fibroid is very vascular, then what happens is when you, when you ablate, any heat will be dissipated, will be taken away by the blood flow. So if we could do uh, UAE, that means uterine artery embolization for this kind of uh, uh, vascular tumor and also for adenomyosis and then perform HIFU, the success rate may be, uh, may be better. So this is another area that we can look at. And finally, can we combine laparoscopic surgery with HIFU? And all of us uh, perform laparoscopic surgery. I've, I've been performing laparoscopic surgery for 25 years and I do it right, routinely. And I'm always uh, uh, unsure as to what to do with a patient with severe endometriosis and adenomyosis. Um, so Dr. Choi from Korea, what he does is that he use, does HIFU for uh, the adenomyosis, and then he does sclerotherapy for endometrioma. What he does is he places a needle into the uh, chocolate cyst and then injects alcohol into it to kill it off. Uh, this is one, one way of dealing in this, dealing this kind of diseases. But my thoughts are we do laparoscopic cystectomy and excision of all the endometriotic nodules and then rest the patient and then follow it by high foo for the adenomyosis. This is something, another area that of, of uh, interest that I will be looking at in future. So in conclusion, I'm sorry, I've taken so much time. In conclusion, uh, uh, HIFU is a disruptive technology. It is a revolutionary technology and also disruptive. This word disruptive was coined by Dr. Lee Kim Lai from, uh, Lee Kim uh, Wai from uh, um, Singapore. And it is disruptive in a good way because more and more women are choosing non-invasive procedure over surgery. And uh, just like MIS many years ago, uh, people look uh, were wary about MIS, but now very few people are doing open surgeries. We are all doing most of our surgeries by MIS. And now we are looking at whether we could do it by non-invasive procedures. And this will be uh, what HIFU is going to do. And uh, we also have got a lot of these debates about morselations, usage of barbed wires for laparoscopic surgery. So if we can bypass all this and do non-invasive procedure like HIFU, this would be very good. And lastly, there will be hope for patients with adenomyosis and patients with adenomyosis who have so much pain and menorrhagia and also trying to get pregnant are the patients who probably will be benefiting a lot from this high food treatment. And I look forward to treating these kind of patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Maruf, and sorry for taking a lot, a little longer than what, I, what the time I was given. Thank you so much, Dr. Selva, for an excellent and elaborate presentation on a new modality uh, we are not at all familiar with. We do have uh, lots of questions from the uh, participants. So I would like to straight go to the question session and then we will have short comments from the panelists. Uh, there's a question from Professor Farhana Dewan. The question is what happens to the destroyed tissue? Is it absorbed, Dr. Silva? Yeah, um, what, what, what happens is that uh, it is tissue necrosis. We, what we are, we are doing, we are killing the disease. So uh, what uh, Professor Wang and uh, another, another marketing manager, marketing, uh, or ma the marketing person in, in, in uh, Chongqing are telling is that if the patient is very active after this treatment, all this necrotic tissue will get absorbed. So that is basically what we want. The, 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 the dead tissue will get absorbed. Some of them will get expelled through vaginal secretion. So even intramural fibroid, as Dr. Lee Kinwai showed in his presentation, are expelled. So they're either expelled through the vagina or get absorbed. But ultimately, there will be some 
tissue that will be left behind. You cannot, for example, the capsule will not, will, will not be uh, removed. So it will be there. So you will have a little bit of tissue, but those are dead tissues and they are not active tissues and, and the chances of regrowing is very small. So that's basically what happens. Okay, thank you. And in those cases, do you prefer to go for a follow-up scan after two, three months to see yes. whether they are absorbed or not? Yes, yes, uh, that's a good point. What is recommended is to actually do MRI and uh, before the procedure and then do the MRI. And after the MRI, do another, uh, after the procedure, do another MRI to see whether there is a non-perfusion. So when, you, when, when we ablate, what we are looking at is blood flow into the fibroid. So if you do a second MRI immediately after the procedure, you can see how much of the tissue is dead actually. But unfortunately, MRI is not cheap. So in many countries, it is not done. So the recommendation is actually to do an MRI before, just after, and probably three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, if you can. But for example, in Singapore, MRI is very expensive. And Dr. Lee Kinwai follow up their patients just with 3D ultrasound to see the shrinkage and the vascularity of the fibroid. So, um, so with that, we have follow up. Of course, we need to follow up. We need to follow up the patient to see uh, how the shrinkage occurs. As, as, I, as I said, it is not 100%. It's percentages is almost 90%. There will be a small percentage that it didn't work. Then we may have to go and re-ablate or maybe you have to do surgery on these patients. Okay, that means you have to detect the vascularity to have an idea. Okay, the next question is from Dr. Renuma Jahan. Is there any chance of decreasing oven and desire following this procedure? I didn't get a question again. A any chance of decreasing ovarian reserve? Yeah, as, as, I, as, I, as I said, as I said uh, uh, earlier, um, I have done this procedure. There, there's no way that you will get the beam into the ovaries when you're doing this procedure. Ovaries is far away. We are, we are doing right in the center of the tissue. And this has been proven by the study that I showed that the AMH is, is the same. And this is one of the worries when you do uterine artery embolization. Uterine artery embolization, if it's done by very good people, your blood flow to the ovary will, will not be affected. But if it's done by not so good people, this is one of the pro worries about uh, uterine artery embolization. As opposed to HIFU, HIFU is low focal uh, ablation. So ovarian reserve shouldn't be affected at all. Okay, the, so the message is the ovarian reserve is not altered following HIFU. Okay, the next question. Uh, is uh, it's from Dr. Afroza Kutubi. Is there any restriction to use HIFU depending upon the size of fibroid? Okay, it's a good question. Now, uh, the, the size limit given by the uh, Chongqing is about 10 to 12 uh, centimeters. But um, there is a single fibroid. But Professor Lian Zhang has done uterus up to 26 weeks multiple fibroids. So you, you may not be able to ablate all the fibroids in one sitting, especially in a huge uterus. They have got a power setting. You cannot, you see, we are, we are now heating up each fibroid. So you have got a limitation of the amount of power that you can put into the uterus at one sitting. So sometimes uh, in, in very, uh, not say not large fibroids or multiple fibroids, you may ablate uh, a certain amount and then you may have to come back and do a second ablation. But in, a, in general, when the fibroid is single, you can do all the ablation in one setting. So the cutoff point, I think as you become more and more experienced, you can deal with bigger and bigger fibroids. But as a beginner, I probably will stop at 10 to 12 centimeter fibroids. But Professor Lian Zhang does any types of fibroids, any size. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the expertise and starting with a smaller one, maybe. Okay, thank you. The next question from Begum Nasrin is, is Haifu comparable to myomectomy in patients having subfertility? Okay, um, good question. Now, um, this is this is where Chongqing is not sure. You know, Chongqing, uh, the, the, the companies are doing. When, M when MR Haifu came into the market, they were telling that you shouldn't be doing for fertility patient. But now we are doing more and more for fertility patient. So if you, you will have a dilemma as to if you have, say, a 12 centimeter intramural fibroid, you want to do HIFU or you want to do, uh, you want to do uh, myomectomy. Now, if the patient is, uh, is uh, uh, has completed her family, 
and doesn't want fertility, HIFU will be the choice because you can do the, you can ablate the fibroid. And if the fibroid recurs, you can do ablate it again. But if the patient wants to get pregnant, we are not sure. We don't have the data to say that which is better. We have been doing myomectomies for ages. We know exactly what the benefit of myomectomy is, but we don't know about HIFU. But my thinking is that HIFU will be a good method for this kind of patients. The reason being, when you do a myomectomy, you're cutting into the myometrium, you're removing the, the fibroids. Sometimes you go into the endo endometrial cavity, you repair. You have to wait for about six months for the patient to conceive. Now, if you do HIFU and if it's successful, within three months, the patient can conceive. You're not cutting anything. You're just shrinking the fibroid. And as the fibroid shrinks, the patient can conceive and the fibroid keeps shrinking, the patient can start try to conceive. So if you have, a, say, a 40-year-old lady with a 12-centimeter fibroid with a lower ovarian reserve, I would choose HIFU than, than going to do my myomectomy. If, if, if I have a 25-year-old lady with a, with a 12-centimeter fibroid, I probably will choose my myomectomy. So I think we have to balance and see which is beneficial for the patient and discuss with the patient what she wants. Okay, does that mean that uh, maybe following myomectomy, we have to wait for three months for the uterus to get healed. So in case of HIFU, we can go straight on or we have to wait for three Usually months? Usually the, the recommendation is about three months as well, three, three months uh, to, for the patient. But we have seen in many, many of these uh, case studies, the patients start starting to get pregnant at two months and nothing happens. So that is, that is the advantage. Okay. But I, what I'm more interested in is in the small fibroids. You have a small fibroid and the patient, we don't, you don't want to subject the patient to an unnecessary laparoscopy or laparotomy for a three centimeter fibroid. And that probably, that patient will probably benefit most from HIFU. Thank you, sir. The next question from Professor Jannatul Ferdos Jonaki. How effective is HIFU in multiple myoma or in diffuse adenomyosis? Okay, as I said, multiple myomas, there's no problem. You can go from one fibroid to another. And this I've, I've seen uh, all the time. Uh, diffuse adenomyosis is a tricky, tricky problem. I have seen Professor Lian Zhang doing the whole uterus uh, with diffuse adenomyosis. That means it goes from one area to another completely. For a patient who is not keen to get pregnant, I think it's fine. You can ablate as much as you want, but for a patient who wants to get pregnant, we don't know. But these patients have got no other choice. What else can you do? So I think this will be, these are the patients that will benefit from HIFU. Symptomatically, yes, they will, they will improve uh, for pain and dysmenorrhea, but whether they will get pregnant, that we don't know. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Dr. Pakhi Agarwal from India. She said that, can this be used for fibroid in any location? Uh, the location that is uh, that we will shy away are pedunculated fibroids. So if you ablate a pedunculated fibroid, then that might drop off into the abdomen. So that, that we don't want to do pedunculated fibroids. You can even do submucous fibroids. There's no problem. What will happen in submucous fibroid is it will come out of the cervix and it, it will just expel through the cervix. Uh, cervical fibroid is a tricky area. I think we'll leave that to the real experts to do cervical fibroids. So intramural fibroids, subserous fibroids, and submucous fibroids, is not, there's no problem. Thank you. We have uh, 20, 30 more questions, so I will take only one, two, because we have time problem. The next question is from Dr. Tabassum Parvin. Is there any risk of thromboembolism with this procedure? No, there shouldn't be any problem with thromboembolism because the patient is lying on, 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 her, on her tummy and we are doing the procedure. And um, so there shouldn't be, as opposed to say we do laparoscopic myomectomy or, or open, my, open, open surgery, we are worried about thromboembolism. There shouldn't be any problem with thromboembolism. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Silva. We have a lot more questions, but due to the time problem, we cannot allow uh, any more. Before going to the panelist, uh, uh, may I ask uh, one single question as a fertility specialist, that uh, after myomectomy, it's sometimes difficult for the patients to conceive especially following adenomyomectomy, sometimes the pain decreases, but it, it is the fertility rate becomes very low. And in our context, it is difficult to use a surrogacy in our country. So in those cases, do you think HIFU would be a much better alternative for treating adenomyomas or myomas rather than go for a laparoscopy or laparotomy? 
Yes, I I don't like laparoscopic adenomyomectomy or open adenomyomectomy because uh, the results are not very good. And if I've done a laparoscopic adenomyomectomy, the patient gets pregnant, I'm worried uh, until the patient delivers, I'm worried whether she will undergo uterine rupture. So these are the patients, in, even in my country, we can't, we can't do surrogacy, so it's banned. Surrogacy is banned. So they have to go elsewhere to do surrogacy. So these are the patients that I'm looking at to help for, for HIFU. I am not sure whether it is going to help all my patients with adenomyosis, but I am quite sure some of them will benefit from HIFU treatment. Thank you, sir. Actually, we have 27 more questions, but I would like to apologize that we must maintain our time. So I will go to the panelists first, and if there is time, we will uh, still come back to the question of cessation. We have uh, five panelists. Uh, I would like to request them to please have uh, their comments on HIFU and if, if they have any question, they can also, also ask Dr. Selva. I will start with uh, Professor Anwara Begum, Madam. She is the past president of Bangladesh uh, Gaini Society and also one of the advisors of the Young Gynecologist Academic Group. So Madam, please, Professor Anwara, Madam. Anwara, Madam, please unmute you. Anwara, Madam, please unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? We can, we, we can hear you, madam. Oh. Madam, are you connected? Yes, madam, yes. you can. Yes, yes. Madam, please unmute yourself. Madam, please unmute. Hello, yes, can yes. you hear yes, me? Madam. Yes, yes, oh, madam. Yes. Thank you, thank you. But, uh, first of all, I want to thank, thank Maru for selecting such a nice subject for today's discussion. And I also want to thank Dr. Silva because he has described the procedure in a, such a simple way and so clearly that we all could understand everything, more or less everything. But I have just got a question, a special training program for this uh, HIFU, or if it is so, is it uh, available for also overseas doctors? And if it is so, what will be the experience for this? Um, as far as uh, uh, HIFU is concerned, although, although it is quite easy, but it needs a lot of training. I have gone for training, but I'm still not comfortable to do it myself. So the, the plan is like this. We, we go for training, the training uh, for most of us are, who are in private practice, we will not be able to go for long-term training. The training is usually for three months, uh, but I just went for two weeks uh, just to get an idea of what the, the, the whole process is. So once the high food treat, uh, machine is available in my country, the experts from the country will come and sit with me for three months until I am competent to do it myself. So that's, that's how the process goes. It's, it's not like just uh, shooting uh, oh, things see. simply. It, it, it is a process that you have to learn. You have to learn to position the patient. You have to learn to uh, adjust the machine. You have to learn how much uh, energy to give for which particular, how to avoid complications. So it's a technical process. It's just like learning how to do laparoscopic surgery. You need time. You need a mentor to, to teach you, and then you learn the, the, the process. And even then, it's an ongoing learning process. The more you do, the better yeah. you become. So it is, although it is, it, it looks very easy. It's actually easier than laparoscopic surgery because it's just like playing video games. You're just shooting something into the abdomen, uh, looking at a screen. But it still requires a lot of skills that will take time to uh, to do. So, so uh, ultimately, it will probably go to. Uh, you will probably have a center with this uh, this machine. But that is the whole process. Go somebody or to send somebody for training and get the machine, and then get the, the expert, somebody to come and sit with, with the doctor, to teach the doctor, and then the doctor will teach other doctors. And that's, that's how the process is going to be. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Maruf, I, I think I want to get outside. Thank, thank you, you, Madam, and uh, I expect Dr. Silva will be very experienced at times, and then we are going to send four or five very young gynecologists to him so that he can train them and they can serve our community later on. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Nusrat Jaman. 
Appa, please unmute yourself. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Firstly, I think uh, uh, Maruf, Dr. Maruf, deserves a very, very heartful thanks for arranging this wonderful webinar, and uh, uh, I must congratulate Dr. Silva as well for uh, highlighting such a wonderful and new era and his excellent deliberation. Actually, he has explained everything in such details that we, uh, there were many questions which were springing in our minds as to uh, see about the detailed procedure, the preparation of the patient, the positioning of the patient about the machine. And he has done a wonderful, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> deliberation and I must congratulate him. This has definitely enriched our limited knowledge on HIFU and as it is a new procedure. It's a very uncanny um, uh, incident that I want to say that only last week, one of my patients who is suffering from secondary infertility, I was mentioning to Dr. Maruf and she went to Singapore. And uh, when she said that, okay, madam, I had, uh, I had my HIFU done. So I was thinking that I, I just saw the capital H, I was thinking it has something to do with hysteroscopy. Then I went into the details and I found HIFU. I read the entire operation note or, uh, coming from Singapore. And I, I just, I was, I felt a little queer and I looked into the recent ultrasounds and I saw this gray scale, you know, this gray scale. So, and then Maruf the next week says that Dr. Silva is going to deliberate on HIFU. So I felt that something really has, you know, it came just like a miracle anyway. So uh, what I guess that from uh, your uh, uh, experience, we have come to know about the management of the fibroids. And I think the, the fibroids, which are several and uh, numerous small fibroids all over the uterus and the diffuse adenomyces, these are really problematic for us regarding their symptoms, distressful symptoms, their uh, relationship with fertility and things like that. And I think, uh, as Dr. our chairperson said that we have moved from laparotomy, open method to laparoscopy, and now we are going into this detail. I think HIFU really uh, shows a promising yeah, um, step ahead. And uh, we have also gone through some literatures and we were seeing the results comparison with only HIFU and HIFU with LNG and HIFU with GNRH. And we were just you know going through them. And you have also, there were many questions like, how many, how many, how much time do we have to wait for starting the treatment of infertility? And you have already said that it has no effect on the uh, amount of uh, level of AMH. And also it doesn't have to require a long wait after the treatment. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Silva. We have really enjoyed your uh, uh, presentation. And HIFU though is a promising treatment option for patients with adenomyosis, but it's efficacy, safety, and cost effectiveness, fertility outcome must uh, undergo some, I think, some RCT for better uh, pro promotion. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Appa. Uh, we'll switch on to our next uh, invited panelist, uh, Professor Maliha Rashid, for her comments. Madam, please. Madam, Shona Jatsana. Please unmute, madam. Hello. 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 Thank you very much, Dr. Maru, for arranging this beautiful webinar. My heartful thanks to Dr. Silva for his nice deliberation. He has discussed about the pros and cons of the Haifu, which is a new chapter for us. Uh, I think this is a part of, uh, um, uh, this is a radiological intervention. So could it be called uh, about, uh, could it be uh, taken as intervention radiological procedure? Uh, my question is that, and can it be uh, better if we include a radiologist in our group to help us? And because we are not so efficient, to uh, perform these radiological procedures. And later on, uh, I have one question to Dr. Silva, uh, that is, uh, could it be possible to 
recognize the leomyosarcoma before uh, doing the procedure as because if it is a sarcoma, it can produce a catastrophe after the treatment. We know the morcillator was banded due to this uh, due to this um, spreading of the leomyosarcoma during the MIS, uh, uh, MIS operations. So, so uh, uh, my uh, one question to Dr. Silva is uh, this. And later on, last of all, I want to give thanks to the organizer, Dr. Maruf again, and, and um, uh, all the panelists here uh, who have uh, joined uh, to end this uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'll answer the questions. Um, the question of radio, interventional radiologists performing this procedure, yes, of course they can do. Uh, in some countries, for example, in, in Egypt, the procedure is done by an interventional radiologist. Um, uh, interventional radiologists will have an advantage because they not only can do fibroids and adenomyces, they can do other things like uh, cancer of the pancreas, liver, etc. So the, the, the only thing is if a gynecologist is willing to learn and he is comfortable with ultrasound, then they can do as well. So there's a difference that I suppose to MR HIFU, where it must be only done by an interventional radiologist. So the question of leomyosarcoma, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, is a very controversial issue. Now, if we are suspecting a leomyosarcoma in a lady, then the treatment should be an open hysterectomy. I think there's, there's, there's no question about that. Even laparoscopic hysterectomy, we are worried. But in if you have a fibroid that you didn't uh, diagnose it as a leomyosarcoma, and if you have done high food, I think the damage is very little. That, that's what I said earlier. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We do already have 10, 12 interventional radiologists joining in our Zoom. So maybe they'll be interested to join you. Uh, before I move on to the next panelist, uh, I can see that uh, our national professor, Shaila Madam, has joined. So it's a pleasant surprise for all of us. I would like to request uh, Professor Shaila, Madam. Madam, please unmute yourself. We would like to hear your voice and have your comments, please. Thank you so much, Madam, for joining, please. Thank you, Dr. Maru. Uh, I, it's really something. Unbelievable, but you have to believe me. But you have seen, we have seen, it's a very exciting and very effective treatment of adenomyosis, especially, and fibroids too, keeping the uterus intact and fertility, potential fertility also intact. It's something I have always said unbelievable, but we had to believe it. And the teacher, I should say, Dr. De Silva. He is really a teacher because he had explained it to such a good voice. And I believe all who are here would understand every word of his is really something. He deserves all the best. I mean, congratulations and good wishes because I'm senior, so I have said good wishes and all the anything. Uh, it looks like he has delivered something from his heart. It's a very good voice, I should say. So I also thank you very much. And this is really something very, very new. We, I have no idea. Recently, because of the corona, we know that it's high flow nasal cannula. And now we came to know something different. The pronunciation is more or less something like similar. Anyway, thank you very much, Maru, for really arranging such a beautiful learning uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so, so much, much, Madam, for your kind presence. Uh, before I switch on to the next panelist, our one of our special guests, Professor Farhana Dewan, is going to leave because of the BCPS. So I would like I'd like to ask uh, Farhana Appa to please say something before she leaves. She is our uh, special guest in this evening. Farhana Appa, please unmute yourself. 
Thank you, Dr. Maru. I'm sorry to interrupt in the middle. My respect to Chief Guest, Professor Ifra Tara, Professor Anwar Begum, and regards to Dr. Maru, Professor Maru, and their audience, good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Maru for arranging this wonderful webinar. It's my proud pleasure to be here as special guest. Medical management of fibroid has long been with us, like we know about the embolization. And today I saw a question, but uh, it wasn't asked whether there is, what is the difference between uh, embolization and uh, hypho and which is better anyway. I think if time, the, then Dr. Silva will answer. But actually, it was really the need of the hour for this high food. And in one study, I saw that they, in Korea, they did a study on 333 patients. And there, they, they came up with one or two things which I wanted. They studied for five years. And they said that it was a hypothesis, a younger patient with active blood flow, the result is better. And fertility has also an effect. The women who have two or three, more than two or three children, in their cases, the result is better. I don't know whether Dr. Silva has the same thing or not, but uh, I think I would like to thank, thank Dr. Silva and I would comment that Maru has given a proposal that our young gynecologists can go over because many women come and they don't opt for surgery. And I think that very important point Dr. Silva has mentioned that the pain in adenomyosis will reduce. That is very important, I think, in this. So thank you very much for giving me the chance, Maru. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Appa. Before we move on to the next panelist, uh, I would like to request uh, uh, our uh, society president, Professor Samina Choudhury, is here. I can see her. Uh, please, madam, uh, your short comments, please. Please unmute yourself. Samina, madam, please unmute yourself. Maru, for this uh, it's 20 minutes. Hello, Sunajat Chakun. Patti, madam. Okay. Uh, thank you, Maru, for uh, inviting me in this uh, excellent webinar. And uh, first of all, what I should say that this is a very smart presentation from Dr. Silva. And uh, definitely, uh, it's a new modality and uh, in the treatment of fibroid and adenomyosis. And it is also a very new subject to me also. And uh, it, it is very much preferable for our, it would be a very much preferable technique for our women because uh, it is non-invasive and there is no scar. Uh, these are things, uh, and it relieves adenomyosis pain then and then. So it 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 has got a very uh, promising future. About the uh, and one thing I want to mention that the Silva, uh, Doctor Silva, is not developed by uh, one day. He has to learn through a. Uh, very skillful process. And the, because this process, in my opinion, it is a fine skill procedure. It needs excess, good training, very good training. And uh, here I want to say about that for one, one course, um, three months course, what will be the cost of a person? Uh, if you give us a package that it must be, it needs so much cost as, uh, and what is the prerequisite of this training uh, who are eligible for this training and also how much is will be the cost of this machine because we are thinking that uh, if we train them definitely uh, for that we need also the machine so if you can uh, tell us and we can have a drive on that because many of our young gynecologists will be uh, trained on this issue uh, and we will try for that. Is it possible to say uh, something about prerequisite and the three months uh, cost, training cost? Thank you very much. Dr. Thank Silva. you so much. Uh, thank you. I, I will answer the question, but... Um, the the cost 
of the machine is actually a very expensive machine and I'm not allowed to tell, say the cost due to technical problem because they, they are probably selling to different countries at different different prices. Uh, so what I would say is I will give the contact of the person in charge of uh, uh, marketing this machine to Dr. Maruf and Dr. Maruf can then discuss with them the cost and then distribute the cost, I mean, the, the, the cost of the machine to the, uh, your, your society. I think that would be better than, than me telling the cost. But um, once you buy the machine, the training is incorporated into the selling of the machine. So it is a package. That means you buy the machine. They not only sell you a machine, they also sell you, include the training for 10 doctors. And the, the, the training is actually very expensive. It, it comes up to almost 40,000 USD per, per doctor. So it's that expensive. But because you buy the machine, they are committed to give you the training. So that's the that's beauty about this company. They don't, they don't just sell your machine. They, they sell you the whole training package. So, uh, so the machine, although you're going to pay a lot of money buying the machine, but you will be able to use that purchase to get training. And not only that, they will continue to give you support, both physically as well as internet, by internet. That means, say for example, after three months, I have completed my, I'm quite comfortable doing the cases and I, am, I have a difficult case. So I could actually, uh, my machine will be connected to the center in Chongqing and I could do the case with them live, they can watch me what, uh, performing the surgery live. So that is a kind of uh, commitment that they give, the, the, the company. So the company is not selling only machine, they're selling the whole training package. But, but as I said, I cannot... Okay, but what is the prerequisite before going for this training? Okay, that's a good, that is a good question. If anybody who has comfortable to do gynecological ultrasound will be able to yes. learn this. It's, 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 it's nothing, nothing matter. As long as you can hold a transducer and do an ultrasound, you can do it. In fact, in China, the, the, the gynecologists are not allowed to do ultrasound and they are training them to do ultrasound and then do high food. So I think most gynecologists who are comfortable to do obstetric ultrasound and normal abdominal uh, gynecological ultrasound can do this procedure. It doesn't require that much skills. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Uh, I think this I webinar has been from you. <laughs> this webinar has been organized by actually the Young Gynecologist Academy Group in order to encourage the young gynecologists, so then they can they can get to know about the newer innovations and they can prepare themselves to train themselves. Uh, our next panelist is Professor Begum Nasrin. Uh, Apa, please unmute yourself for a short comment, Professor Begum Nasrin. Thank you, Dr. Maru, for uh, arranging such a uh, webinar on a new topic. Uh, we, uh, I, I am very thankful to Dr. Silva for his wonderful and detailed deliberation. We learned a lot about HIFU. HIFU is a new modality of treatment in case of fibroid and adenomyosis. It is a non-invasive, organ-sparing, thermo ablative procedure, and it can be done in OPD basis and without anesthesia. In clinical practice, we found that many patients come uh, with uh, adenomyosis, they are suffering from uh, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, but we cannot do anything. We, we treated, they treated them medically, they suffer from infertility, we cannot do any help for them. In this case, it's, it's a great hope for them. It can be a great hope. But my question is, HIFU is approved in USA in 2004, and in Europe in 2002, but why HIFO has not became the popular throughout the developed country yet not? Okay, that, that's a very good question. Um, my answer to you is that the HIFO that was approved by FDA and also the European is the MRI-based HIFO. Now, as I said earlier, the MRI-based HIFO is not as effective as the ultrasound-based HIFO. Unfortunately, the ultrasound-based HIFU is developed in China. Can you imagine China getting FDA approval? They will never get an FDA approval. So that's the reason why they are just bypassing America. They, are, they have got CE mark is available in, in, uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, and because being a Chinese company, they are very cautious. This, that's what I realized. They have been doing this 
for almost 20 years, but they are very cautious. They are taking it step by step. And only in the last two years, they have decided that they want to go global. They have, they, they, and that's the reason why people like me are brought into the picture to bring this machine. So, so your question is very valid. I, I also have heard of Haifu many years ago, and I thought it was not a, not a very good modality. But this company uh, has, has developed the technology to do Haifu using ultrasound, and its effectiveness is far better than MR. So that's, that, that's the reason why we are hearing more about uh, uh, Haifu now compared to before. That's just how I answer your question. Thank you, Dr. Silva. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, Maru, for uh, include me as a panel, panelist. Thank you, Appa. And, uh, we would like to move to the last panelist, Professor Muna Salim Adhan. Appa, please unmute yourself and comment. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my regards to all my senior pro professor teachers and our uh, colleagues here. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Maru first for um, just forming this platform so that uh, we can interact um, on uh, different academic issues. Uh, and I'd like to uh, extend my artist congratulations and thanks to Dr. Silva for his uh, uh, eye-opening um, talk on this new modality of treatment. Uh, so far, uh, I have gone through literatures. Um, I found it that uh, the already uh, uterine artery embolization is already there as minimal invasive procedure for both uh, um, fibroid and adenomyosis. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, this uh, minimally, or at, uh, or we can say it uh, uh, non-invasive, this ablative procedure, uh, it is a little bit higher in this respect that um, uh, uterine artery embolization uh, causes uh, a little bit early menopause. Uh, there is risk of two to three years earlier menopause it can uh, do, and also that can reduce the ovarian reserve and decrease AMH, which I think um, Dr. Silva has already clearly mentioned that uh, and shown uh, by showing one evidence that uh, one literature that uh, it doesn't cause significant change in AMH. So this is one advantage, I think. Mm, and I have a few short questions to Dr. Silva. Like uh, you have already mentioned that inadvertent uh, interposition of uh, bowel may be uh, there and it is, uh, it is unfortunate if, because there is risk of injury or burn to the bowel. Uh, do you do bowel preparation regularly before this procedure? Yes, yes. yes. Patients, uh, we need to do very strict bowel, uh, bowel preparation when we do this procedure. The patient has to be on... Uh, uh, what you call as liquid diet, a low residue diet for three days, three to four days, then liquid diet for one day, and then they will have bo uh, proper bowel preparation. So we want the bowel to be as uh, compressed as possible so it doesn't come into the field when we do this procedure. So that's very, very important. Okay, and another question is, uh, you have already mentioned that some, some uh, uh, surgeons are doing uh, preoperative uh, reduction of the size of the um, fibroid by using uh, GnRH analog. But uh, do you use, uh, in some literature I have seen that they use um, paraoperative oxytocin infusion to make uh, uterus uh, contracted so that the bleeding will be less and uh, the time of the uh, procedure is less. Uh, do you do that? Yes, it is part of the protocol. It is now part of the protocol that we use oxytocin during the high food procedure. So that, that is it's a very good point. I didn't go to technical details, but uh, we give uh, sedation and we give uh, what we call as we give oxytocin for contraction while the high food is done. And at the end, we also go, uh, use uh, something called Sonoview, which is actually an ultrasonic contrast to see the blood flow in the uterus after the procedure. So this is how we determine that we have completely ablated the uterine fibroid. So the point of oxytocin is correct. We use oxytocin during the surgery. Okay, my last question is, uh, you have mentioned about the skin scar, but is there uterine scar, like uh, two or three cesarean section or previous myomectomy, does it cause any problem? No, the, 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 the problem is the uh, skin burns. If you have an incision on the uterus, we're only worried about the bowel as long as you can see that the bowel is not there or the, the field in which you're aiming the 
beam is away from the bowel, then you can do. In fact, we can, even we are worried that this bowel is quite near, we can ablate the area away from the bowel, uh, away from the, the, the bowel area, then the, the area inside. So we, we are not aiming for 100% uh, kill of all the cells. If we can get 60, 70%, then the remaining, of, remaining tissues that are not uh, ablated will die off. So that's the aim, but still bowel is a very important point. Okay, thank you, Dr. Silva. And uh, I think we, everyone who has participated uh, in today's webinar are benefited. And uh, so uh, in future, I think we can call up you for training of our juniors so that we can introduce this uh, modality in our country. Thank you again. And thanks, Maruf, and thanks, everybody. Thank you, Munapa. Actually, uh, this is a young gynecologist academic group. And when we selected your subject, we were quite uh, undecided whether we would be able to gain some knowledge from you. But I think at the end of the day, we can see a lot of gynecologists are really interested to get to know to this new procedure. Uh, but unfortunately, we have a lot of questions, but the time is uh, really over. And Dr. Selva is really looking sleepy because it's nearly 11 p.m. at Malaysia. So, and uh, uh, to the, to, from tomorrow, actually, uh, I get to know him when I had the opportunity to get trained by him in an APGET group, an Asia Pacific Gynecology Endoscopy Training Group. His name is Sevalaraja Supermanium, but I think he's a superman in gynae endoscopy. Uh, that's what really we can learn from him. Apart from Hifu, he is a very good endoscopic surgeon. So we are nearly come to the end of the program. I would like to uh, request our special guest, Professor Salma Roof, to please say a few words about today's program. Professor Salma, in, Appa, <clears throat> thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Appa. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Maruf and the Young uh, Gynecology Group to arrange such a wonderful webinar. My special thanks to Dr. Silva uh, uh, for her very innovative presentation. And actually, we know that the fibroid is a very common gynecological problem, but its management is also challenging because not all fibroids need treatment. And at the same time, not all complaints are due to fibroid. So whenever we plan to manage a patient, we need to be very sure that uh, the fibroid is responsible for all the complaints that for which we are going to treat. And at the same time, uh, the procedure uh, HIFU is a very uh, innovative one and it's a very new technique. And I think that <clears throat> in near future, uh, we could train our young gynecologist so that our patient would be benefited because it's a non-invasive procedure and we can avoid very uh, unnecessary treatment or sometimes uh, patients are subjected to over-treatment for fibroid. And that we can avoid if we uh, um, train our gynecologist to uh, this technique. But uh, for Silva, uh, Maruf, uh, whether uh, that uh, Dr. Silva is supposed to, uh, was supposed to come in our last uh, conference at Cox's Budget? I was there. Yes, I was there. I was there. in uh, in came uh, and, and he lost his luggage. Yes, and I lost my luggage, yes. <laughs> so did, did we meet? You came, but we yeah, yeah, I was meet. there. I was there at your meeting, your last meeting. Yeah. I, I, spoke, I spoke. I spoke on endo endometriosis, recurrent endometriosis. Oh, okay, okay. I forgot. <laughs> so <laughs> the next time, when uh, I hope the situation will permit to invite you, and at that time we'll be, we'll have more information about that new technique. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we'd like to thank you all for your kind presence and participation. Our special thanks goes to Nobista Pharma from Young Gynecologist Academic Group for the technical support. I would like to request our chairperson, Professor Ifa Tara Madam. Professor Ifa Tara Madam and Professor Aronora Madam, they are our advisors and they have, they have been advising us pretty well. So I would like to request Professor Ifa Tara Madam uh, to have her concluding remarks. And with her remarks, so today's uh, webinar is going to end. Uh, before I leave, I must, uh, uh, thank Dr. Silva for spending so much time for us and we are really benefited and we are uh, really encouraged by your procedure. Thank you so much. I would like to hand over to Professor Ifatara, madam. Madam, what are you doing?
लार्निंग and this modality it is very interesting it is time consuming uh, no scar mark no stain i think it is just like a day surgery but about the cost i think the cost is uh, still too much anyway whenever the cost comes down this modality of treatment will be welcomed by each and every one it is it is no doubt a very good procedure but for common people how far it will be effective i don't know but those who can afford for example the high class affluent society they can go to singapore they can go to bangkok they can go to malaysia they can get the treatment but our common people for our common people i think it will take a time when the machine <laughs> price comes down and ultimately this treatment will be very very much popular i am very much hopeful about this treatment modality since it is very very effective i think day care surgery just like thing less traumatic no blood loss and uh, return of fertility is very very early thank you once again everybody dr maruf your um, dr stella silva he is such a wonderful presentation and all the attendees who attend this meeting are thankful because we all were very very much uh, helpful in our learning outcome we learned a lot and it was a very good opportunity a very good window for us i hope now i should say thank you once again everybody Thank you, madam. And on behalf of Young Gynecologist Academic Group, uh, we would like to conclude here. Our sincere thanks go again to Dr. Sevilla Raja Supermaniam, and we certainly hope that you can make some time in future for some other subjects also, if we invite. Thank you so much for accepting our invitations, and good night, good night to you all. Okay. Bye -bye. Good night. Uh, bye bye. Dr. Maruf, if 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 you yeah. want me to answer those questions, maybe you just uh, email it to me, and I can. Oh, of course, of course, of course.